You're listening to Minor Talk On Demand exclusively on 600 ESPN El Paso. Stay up to date with Minor Talk by downloading the free 600 ESPN El Paso mobile app. All right, Minor Talk is live, along with Sal Montes, Alberto Loretta, Zay Galindo, who will come in and join us here in just a little bit. I'm Adrian Bradis. We were talking about another UTEP loss here on the program. Happy birthday, Alberto, here on the program as we get things started, 26 years young. Uh, we'll get into that here in a little bit as well. Minor Talk brought to you every uh, edition by Jack in the Box. Big shout-out to Jack in the Box uh, for providing uh, always um, this, this excitement here. Here on this show, there's 15 locations located all across El Paso and Las Cruces open 24-7. Jack in the Box is the perfect spot before and after every game. Big shout out to Jack in the Box, our presenting sponsor here on Minor Talk. Also, big shout out to the Oscar Idietta Agency. Hey, the Oscar Idietta Agency is currently looking for new hometown heroes. Hey, the hometown heroes, uh, heroes walk among us every single day. Teachers, uh, you also talk about nurses, you talk about maybe first responders. The Oscar ID at the agency is looking for nominations for their next hometown hero. If you think of somebody who should be honored, message us 600 ESPN El Paso or tag them at Allstate Oscar. Or you could check them out on Instagram and Facebook, Oscar ID at the agency for their hometown hero award as we get things started here on Minor Talk. Wow, a tough loss here for the Miners as they lost 20-13 to to Middle Tennessee. A lot of vitriol from fans so far. Um, and yeah, it's a tough, tough going for this UTEP squad. 14,000 in attendance to watch this one. And it really boiled down to the final couple possessions. I mean, if you really think about it, I look to the final two possessions uh, on both sides to where this game was really won. I mean, on both sides. It was a really interesting one, Sal, because, you know, I think fans will be frustrated. Some fans will say, oh, well, I expected this right here. I thought that the Miners would lose in this matchup right here. However, uh, the way that they lost this one, I just found it real disappointing. I think that's where I'm opening this off. Uh, I think they should have won the Southern Utah game at home. I think they should have won the Louisiana Tech game on the road. And despite starting a true freshman quarterback for the first time since 2013 when they started Mac Lefwich, uh, the Miners falling in this one in a game which I thought they should have won. I mean, Middle Tennessee didn't have a lead until that fourth quarter, uh, but before that, it wasn't. Um, they didn't have a lead until they led 3 nothing early on into this game. As many plays as the offense has when it comes to them being on offense and as many times as they're on the field, to only get 13 points, man, that's uh, that's inexcusable. And even to that point, let's say Flabiano makes the field goal. Okay, to only get 16 points despite being out there for so long, it's uh, it's horrible, man. Defense goes out and forces turnover after turnover, and uh, they they hang tough up until the very end as well. They're starting, um, they're, they're having Middle Tennessee start on their side sometimes or in a couple plays they're you know they're in that position so just a big letdown by the offense today this defense is um is one of the best in conference usa and it's it's no bias here just looking at the film they're incredible but the offense is not doing them any favors None whatsoever, Sal. I totally agree with that. I, you know, let's get things started. Our telephone number, 915-505-6009. We're talking UTEP football here on Minor Talk. 600 ESPN El Paso on Twitter and X and 600 ESPN El Paso, our free mobile app where you can listen live and chat with us directly off this game. Um, you know, here's a, here's how I saw this one in the fourth quarter. Uh, the Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders had a drive that, you know, you know, it was, it was okay. They give it back to UTEP. UTEP. Uh, UTEP has a 50-yard drive all the way inside Middle Tennessee territory. And at this point, it's a tie game. It's 13-all, um, and it was a 41-yard missed field goal by Buzz Flabiano. Just what you mentioned right there, Sal. Middle Tennessee gets it. They drive down the field around the midfield point, and then they punt it around the 50. UTEP had a fair catch at the 6-yard line. That was red flag number one for me. I was thinking to myself, wait, why did they fair catch it there at the six-yard line? That was kind of crazy to me. Uh, But regardless, UTEP was sacked on second down. They had the ball at the one-yard line. Somehow they managed to give their punter some breathing room right there. And then Middle Tennessee uh, gets the ball around midfield. Actually, it wasn't a terrible punt right there at that point. Middle Tennessee had it. They convert on two key third downs. They score on a one-yard rushing touchdown. 
and they chew off five minutes off the clock. Well, then, uh, Sal, UTEP gets the ball. It's under two minutes to go in the game. And UTEP had burned a timeout on that previous drive for Middle Tennessee. They were uh, all the way down inside the 10-yard line. And they burned a timeout that I didn't really like. It was right after the two-minute warning, by the way. And then um, on the next drive for the Miners, when they had it on offense... They started to call time. They didn't use any of their timeouts. They had about over 90 seconds to go on that final drive. Of course, it would have been to either tie the game or maybe if they go for two to try to win it. Regardless, they were able to move the ball down the field on some checkdowns. But, Sal, I really didn't have confidence that this team would score a touchdown on that final possession, despite what we're seeing on Twitter with people arguing, oh, there should have been a pass interference late in that game. Oh, you know, this, that, and the third. The bottom line for this, UTEP mismanaged the clock at the end, and because of the mismanagement on the clock and not using the timeouts when they needed to, they ended up losing and not even uh, giving themselves a proper chance to either tie or win the game in the end. And and it's crazy because we see UTEP uh, this year in various spots, and I'm not saying they're going to, just looking at the way they've played and looking at the schedule, this is not to say they would have won half of those games, but in the games that they've lost where they've had chances to win, you see how they just find different ways to lose. And good, good way of saying it. It's, it's so disappointing, man, because the skill position players that they have, I understand that there's injuries, and you and I were talking about this earlier, but every team's banked up at some point. You know, yeah. you, you've got to find ways to, to go out there and get it done. And uh, what I'm getting at, though, is the skill position players that they have, um, you definitely want to see them do a bit more, but also having them be put in better positions to take advantage of opportunities. Yeah, and I, I just, you know, there were some play calling situations that I just didn't love. Didn't love uh, the clock management at points as well. There's just little things I'll pick at in this game. And, you know, some people will pick at J.P. Pickles, the true freshman who's starting. I'll just remind you, again, it's a true freshman. The first time a true freshman starts at quarterback for UTEP since Mac Leftwich in 2013. Now, there might be UTEP fans who say, okay, wait. Why are they starting a true freshman quarterback? I, I mean, Skyler Locklear had, uh, he was out of this game due to a concussion. He was in concussion protocol. Cade McConnell, remember, he's a more seasoned quarterback, but he's out for the year at this point. So now you had to turn the page to two true freshman quarterbacks as your only two options here, uh, for your gunslingers. So it's JP Pickles and it's Shea Smith. And they went with Pickles in this game, the entirety of the game. And, you know, as, as far as people saying, oh, well, Shea Smith should play or at what point you just throw in Shea Smith. I think it could be 50-50. I think there's, you could make that argument, yes, but at the same time, uh, Shea Smith, he could have one more game under his belt only before he burns a year of eligibility. So you, do you want to throw him out there uh, to see what you got? I think I'm leaning to yes, Sal. I think I would just want to see what you have in that quarterback in Shea Smith. No knock on J.P. Pickles. I actually like the game he had, and I want to talk a little bit more about him. Uh, or I'm just going to say this. I didn't necessarily like it. I'm just not going to put the blame on him for this loss. So let, let me ask you this then. You, you said uh, you, you want to see what Shea Smith can do out there, and I completely agree. But when is that? Is that this upcoming game against Kennesaw? Is it against Tennessee? Who You're running out of games. You, you know You're what running I mean? out of games. So th- there's one of three left. But even then, let's say he does well. Well, congratulations on this next one. Congratulations. You're not going to see him the rest of the year if that's the case. So I get what you mean, and I'm on board, but I would probably pick it either Kennesaw or the Aggies um, you know, to, to end things off. I, I don't want to just do it right away. Good point. And by the way, uh, J.P. Pickles, he's played in only two games, so you could make the same argument for him. Well, there's exactly. three games left. It, Maybe you shelve mm-hmm. him on one of these games, and you don't have him necessarily playing on any of these other ones. So, yeah, appreciate all. By the way, our chief engineer, Mike Rivera, uh, who fixed our app today, and we are back on board on our 600 ESPN El Paso free mobile app, by the way. Big shout out to him. Let's say what's up to the birthday boy. Boy, It is Alberto Retta. Uh, Alberto, you've heard us talk a little bit here so far to kick things off here on Minor Talk. Your instant reactions to the 20-13 to loss for UTEP. Well, it's uh, the miners have big have they've they've just become really uh, familiar, but disappointingly familiar. You know, when the miners receive the ball with nine minutes left in their own half, deep in their own half, I I turned to you and said, "Watch them give a poor poor field position here," 
and then give up a touchdown and lose the game. And that's exactly what happened. So it's it's really when you hang the when you hang the game in the balance at the end there, the Miners just haven't been able to put it together. So that's extremely disappointing. And I think just uh, the thing that I take home with me is the Miners had one 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 drive that that was over five minutes, and it culminates with only a field goal attempt, no points. On the other side, Middle Tennessee, they have a drive of over five minutes, and it culminates in a touchdown. That's the difference maker at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you on that one right there. As we get things started here, Minor Talk is continuing. 915-505-6009. Middle Tennessee defeats UTEP. It's 20-13. to That's the finish. The Miners fall to 1-8 and on the season. Um, I talked about this earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. I just felt like the Miners really should have won this one. They led for the majority. I know it was tied at points in this game, but they had a lead in this one. They felt It felt like only three points. I mean, just an utter disappointment of that. That second half specifically just three points to score in that second half and it started off that mishap by middle tennessee sal it was a yeah, near boyd exactly. matthews force fumble off the kickoff return and or the kickoff coverage utep gets the ball right around the red zone yeah. they weren't even able to move the ball whatsoever they get an easy buzz flabiano field goal but only three points to show for that turnover right there and three turnovers the utep forced only three points off those three turnovers. Yeah, and that's not acceptable at all. This is a defense who's going out there, and you literally cannot give them a better opportunity uh, than what they did. And we can even look at that interception, too, near the end of the first half where, um, you know, fortunately did not result in a touchdown. So if you're UTEP and you're on offense, you definitely got to figure something out because the opportunities that are being given to you are, are right there on a silver platter. But game after game, there's no improvement. Well, offensively, the Miners in this matchup were outgained 333 to 305. So they were right there. I mean, this was about as even of a matchup as you can imagine. And Middle Tennessee is a bad team. I mean, these two teams are bad. You can just see it right there. Middle Tennessee, I think, is the fourth worst scoring offense in college football. At least that's what they came into today's matchup uh, averaging. Just, you know, they were they were one of the worst scoring offenses you're going to find in college football. And the Miners are right there with them. They're only two back. I think they're sixth worst uh, in FBS right now, uh, just as it stands. And that tells you that this UTEP team still has a lot of improvement to do, albeit I get it, it's a true freshman quarterback who's out there, but still put him in better situations, you have a lot of opportunities to win that game, you force three turnovers, and you just don't do it, you just don't execute down the stretch so, uh, a letdown loss here as we continue uh, 915-505-6009 Andy from the west side is going to get things started here on the phone lines as we get things started here on Minor Talk 915-505-6009 Andy, good afternoon or good evening I should hey. say what's happening man? How are you? Not too, not too bad. It's a, it's an early uh, day, so I can actually call in. Oh, I love it, Andy. That's good stuff, I'm not man. Asleep, but uh, no, they, I mean, growing pains. It's like ah, uh, it growing pains for sure. Uh, pickles. Sometimes he's looking really good. Sometimes he's scrambling really good, and then sometimes like, where is he throwing it? But I mean, that, that's that's to be expected. But, uh, no, just the, the big thing that I saw is we had a chance, both at the end of the game, you mentioned it earlier about the clock management, because we had two timeouts going into the halftime. We, ha- we were probably midfield-ish, and we are third down. We had two timeouts to go. Why not take a shot? And, and uh, they just let the clock run. And they got a couple boos off of that. Uh, and, and so it's like, manage the clock a little bit better. We might have a different outcome. You know, I, that, that's an interesting take, Andy, because I was trying, I was like thinking to myself, was I the only one who heard that? Did, was I the only one who heard the boos at the end of the first half? And it's crazy, Andy, because it was a 10 10 game, right? So it's like, okay, you could make the argument if you were very pro UTEP, why are you booing in this situation? Why are you upset when this team is competing in this matchup against a conference USA foe? Um, you know, when you're at home with your fourth string or third string quarterback, essentially. Andy, to those people right there, what I would say is um, this is supposed to be a group right here that is fearless in terms of trying to take shots or just trying to take chances. And like you mentioned, they had the timeouts. They just didn't want to do it. They didn't have the urgency to go out there and, and uh, you know try to move the ball before halftime. 
That, yeah, that is what, what I, I – and I was like, what the heck? You got about – it wasn't quite 10 seconds. It was maybe 15 to 20. And it's like, you got time. You got two timeouts. Why not? Why not? You're, you're not going to get the ball back at the beginning of the second half. And then kind of at the, you know, at, at the end of the game, too, they burned about another 10 seconds or so because, yeah, they got a first down – but the ball was in the middle of the field, and they had two timeouts. They could have called a timeout to just give themselves a little bit more time to take a couple more shots down the field. But, again, it's growing pains. I know, you know, I, I like what I saw out of Pickles. And, um, you know, he's young, you can tell, but I liked what I saw. All right, I've got more Pickles thoughts later, but I appreciate the phone call, Andy. Thanks for weighing in. 915-505-6009. Really good takes there by Andy. I appreciate that one right there. A uh, friend of the program has joined us out at the District West before as well. So uh, big shout-out, by the way, to the District West. We had a great experience, had a chance to try their brunch menu. Great crowd at the District, had some excellent giveaways. Uh, got a chance to see a lot of friends of the show. Joe Chacon was there in the flesh. He got to show you his... Is minor tat Sal that was really cool in itself uh, also big shout out to people like Lucamotive Minor who was out there Sean Thuri Aiden everybody who was out there who said hi who stopped by uh, and joined us out at the district that was a lot of fun it was a great um, you know chance to be out there pregame and then get a chance to talk to people here post game as Minor Talk continues Middle Tennessee defeats UTEP 20 to 13 you want to talk about it we've got lines available 915-505-6009 but before we do that Let's pause 10 seconds for station identification. You're listening to Minor Talk, brought to you by Jack in the Box, right here on 600 ESPN El Paso. As we continue, let's go to David on the east side, 915-505-6009. David, good evening. What's happening, man? How's it going? David, I'm I'm hanging in. I'm doing all right, man. I'm I'm doing just fine. It's Saturday. It's early evening, so we're hanging in right here. Give us your thoughts on this game. Okay, uh, I like the way. Well, the, the defense always plays good. Okay, uh, first half they played good. Second half, in fact, the last sixty seconds, minus half of the ball, they're driving. Why doesn't Walden call a timeout? Real simple. Okay, first down, they get that's about That's it? That's all you have? Yards. What What else, David? What else? Um, that's it. That's it. Uh, I'm with you. And and you know what? Honestly, David, I completely agree with you. The la- the timeouts and the issues that happened on that final drive, they were they were terrible. They, there were those frustrating things where the Miners had opportunities. They called a timeout after an incompletion, David. And, you know, you really think about it on that final drive. They had opportunities. And they were on basic checkdowns. Uh, Zay Galindo welcoming him into the program. It's only fitting that the first caller that he hears is talking about the timeout out issues Zay this is one of those things that was just so prevalent tonight or excuse me today throughout this matchup right here but really magnified at the end they call a timeout on defense while Middle Tennessee is threatening at the one following a two minute timeout or the two minute warning I should say and then uh, you look on the flip side offensively they let a lot they let way too much clock kill when they had two timeouts uh, left under their belts. Yeah, you know, I was just in shock, you know. I was not keeping up with the timeout situation throughout the second half and you know, in that final drive, I I looked up and it said, you know, they had two timeouts remaining and they weren't using them. So, I kind of just assumed, okay, no way they have two timeouts and they're not using them on this drive specifically. I thought it was a typo until they finally did call a timeout with however many seconds remaining after an incompletion, right? The clock was already stopped. They called a timeout because they were out of sorts. They 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 didn't know what player they were going to run, which is I mean, it's so frustrating. It kind of just magnifies how bad this time management has been, especially in that game specifically. Yeah, I'm with you, man. Uh, let's go to Twitter real quick and X, 915-505-6009, before we get to Rob and Carlos. Uh, B. Murray, which, by the way, shout out to Murray. He was out at the district as well. The unholy trinity strikes again. Number one, abysmal offensive play calling. Number two, poor time management. Number three, Buzz Flaviano's missed 
kick. Uh, Will support this team no matter what, but this team is very unfortunate. That's what Murray had to say. This is Brian. Terrible clock management. I don't know, man. Scotty Walden seems like a great guy, but I don't know if he can turn this team around. Memo says, we are next level bad. 1-11 is back into play. This is Richard Diamond. So will we see a pickup in the second half. There was opportunities in the first. The defense is mostly ahead of them on the field. Coach Clark has them coached up well. They can. It's up to the offense to take over. Uh, Post game as well. This is Memo. 1-11 and is back on. I will see you guys next year. Uh, and I think a lot of fans are kind of checked out and kind of done with, you know, how this season has really gone so far. 1-8 and for the season for the Miners. They have Kennesaw State next week. That's a very winnable game at home. Just like today, it was very winnable uh, as we continue. Going to the phones, we've got Rob next with us. Rob, good evening, man. What's happening? Hey, what's going on, Adrian? How are you? Rob, I'm doing well, man. I was thinking of you today when I was uh, checking out my clean water Vel Paso system. So uh, I hope you're doing well, man. Give us your thoughts on this one. I just – this game right here, this has got to be one of the most frustrating ones because to me it was, a, it was a softball pitch, meaning you're favored at home against a team that has the worst uh, pass defense in the Conference USA. This was a softball pitch for UTEP to come out with a win. I mean, they were favored. That's that's to me what's frustrating. It's not the <clears throat> it's not the Sam Houston game or Nebraska or Liberty. It's it's games like this, the Southern Utah game and uh, um, this Middle Tennessee game, where where you have a you know a very easy opponent to beat. They, I mean, they turned the ball over three times, and we only come out with uh, thirteen points. I, I think the. I think that the defense and the coaching staff on on the defensive side of the ball is where it needs to be. Um, they are so lackluster on offense, and I can't I can't even blame the quarterback because I feel like it looks the same with every quarterback that's out there. And what I mean by that is it's like they're trained to never look deep. He missed he missed about three reads on that last drive. Guy's running wide open. He doesn't even look. It's just like it's throw short or or run. And I feel like that's their their MO going into practice all week. Um, it's run on a first down, run on a second down, and then you're putting a freshman quarterback at a third and seven. And it's you're just not doing your quarterbacks uh, any favors. And I don't think, uh, you know, an upgraded quarterback would really help if you're just going to keep calling runs on first down, second down. Uh, you're not doing yourself any favors. And then, um, and yeah, like just how everyone else hit on it was the, the poor time management and, and Flaviano, who's a scholarship kicker, seems to miss field goals in the most crucial times of of UTEP's home games, um, which I find it odd. But you know, that's a scholarship kicker that should be able to knock those down. So they're just they're a mess um, on offense. And coach is supposed to be an offensive specialist. So you know, I just I, I don't I don't know. You know, I I don't know what what goes into the game plan. I don't think anybody does, but I do believe that. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, may, maybe maybe he just doesn't feel confident in the quarterback to to call a more dynamic offense. But as for right now, it feels very similar to last year. I mean, we're averaging 13, 17 points a game. This is this is demo two point running quarterback, throw it up, uh, run it up the middle. Of uh, yeah, it's just it's you know. And if we could see that from the couch, like what do you think the other team could see? Uh, Division one coaching staff. So. Um, you know they got they got a lot of work to do on that side of the ball, and um, you know at this point it's just been you know all coaching. I think they sold us all summer a bill of goods about this high flying offense, and we have not seen that. So I'm still waiting for that to come out. Yeah, I think everybody is. Rob, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for the phone call. Thanks for waiting. A lot to take away from that call there. Uh, Sal, I got to bring you in for the Buzz Labiano stats. Okay, here we go. All right. Uh, On the season, he is 8 of 12. Uh, He is 2 of 3 for field goals between 20 yards and 29. He is 1 of 2 between field goals of 30 and 39 yards, and then 5 of 7, 40 and beyond. So that is your Buzz Flabiano stat of the day. He's a 66% field goal kicker. He is what he is. Yeah, he, he might make it, he might not. It, it, but the unfortunate part, though, is that when 
when points were hard to come by and the window for winning is closing, he, he really hasn't come through, at least this year. We know that he was clutched last year, but this year, other than um, the Florida International game, it's hard to rely on him. However, I say all this um, knowing that he's 66%, and he's not the reason that they lost today. No, he's not. He's not. I mean, they make the field goal, and what do you, what do you have? Alberto, thoughts on uh, Rob's call? Well, yeah, I, I understand the the, the Flaviano sentiments, and and it's it's easy to 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 be very angry at just him. But no, there's so many other places in, on this team where you, you could clearly point out, well, you could have been better here, you could have been better here, and it would have made the worlds of difference. Uh, do you need a better kicker? Yeah, but I yeah I think the team needs to address a whole lot of other things uh, before they need to start looking at other kickers. No, let's, right. let's uh, address true issues first. Zay, your thoughts. Yeah, you know, he talked about, you know, the reads down the field and and Scotty Walden said it in the presser that he was really really happy with the way JP Pickles that he said that, you know, on specific plays he was making, you know, the right reads. He was looking the right way. So, I guess that kind of really does confirm that hey, the whole game plan was was keep it short, keep it simple for for the true freshman, and you know I, I was pleasantly surprised that he did a little bit better than I expected, but it just wasn't enough. It wasn't good enough, and you know the, the outcome shows that. I totally agree with that. Let's keep it moving now at 5505-6009. A uh, couple other tweets to get to. This is our boy David Castro. I just don't know how he lost this one. Our defense shows up. Our kicking game and offense struggles so much. How do they call pass interference on UTEP on the previous drive, but not on that final play? Same story, different day. I don't know. At Matt Castro. Uh, and he's actually uh, giving us a picture with his little one. So great photo there, David Castro. Love it. Uh, And thanks for chiming in on the program with us. Zay, uh, give us more breakdowns on the press conference. What are some of the other takeaways you had from head coach Scotty Walden? He did not join the radio broadcast. I tweeted this out uh, that they couldn't find him or locate him, I should say. He ended up going to the media scrum anyways before. So nonetheless, uh, you got a chance to hear from Coach Walden. What do you have to say? Yeah, you know, he he was definitely, you know, this one definitely hurt. I guess you could say that. You could tell in his voice and the way he was speaking, you know, he wanted this one. And he talked a lot about the seniors, you know, they're three games remaining in their career. And and they're playing with a lot of heart. That's what he said. So it wasn't much to take away from it, right? He he thanked the fans a lot of times. He he said, you know, we need to give them something to cheer about. And then obviously losing, they're not going to cheer about that. But he thanked them that they showed out. I think it was 14,000, which was more than I expected. So once again, you know, you could tell in his voice, he really, really wanted to get this one. He was not happy with that, that pass interference call at the end on Josiah Allen that, that kind of gave Middle Tennessee the touchdown. But uh, other than that, not much to take away from his presser. Totally, totally understand on that one. As we continue now in five five zero five six zero zero nine, as as uh, we move forward here on Minor Talk, Isao Hermosillo tweets the program and he checks in with this one. Why does Scotty Walden always quit before halftime with time on the clock? With excellent field position at that. Interesting take right there as well. Let's move on. Let's get to another caller. It's Carlos, who is next up on the phone lines. Carlos, good evening, man. What's happening? Hey, guys. What's going on? Uh, yeah, this one was this one was rough. You know, I, I left the game thinking to myself, how did we lose? You know, it, it, it just felt as if, like, everything was working with us or we were in it toward the very end. I, I just can't wrap my head around the fact that we lost. And I try to nitpick. I try to be like, oh, well, J.P. Pickles, you know, he threw around a little bit north uh, or north of 50%. But you can't be mad at his performance. I just don't know what to be mad at. And I guess my default is play calling. But at the same time, hey, at least they tried to throw the ball down the field. I didn't see so many screens, thank the Lord. But, yeah, this one just this one broke me guys uh, I, I guess it's on to uh, basketball already I think it is man and I think we're going to talk a lot of basketball in this show actually uh, my pal uh, Carlos as we continue I, I know that this one feels like almost a disbelief the La Tech one made me feel like alright UTEP had that one in the bag they end up losing that one uh, the Southern Utah game I'm like there's no way they're losing to an FCS team at home and Zay this one I, I still am wondering how did they lose this one they were up 13-10 to 10. they had all the momentum in the third quarter after that kickoff um, you know, fumble, forced fumble 
and then they couldn't do anything after that. They really they couldn't, and they had that Flabiano missed field goal. I get it. That's where they drove all the way inside Middle Tennessee territory, but that's not winning you the game. You have to score a touchdown there. Yeah, you know, that, that offense, it's going to say that they scored three points in the second half, but did they really right? They, did that, they didn't earn those three points. It was recovered on a fumble. They, they got into field goal territory, but at the end of the day, it's a 42-yarder. You know you have a, a 50-50 kicker almost. You know, you're, they just weren't good enough. And once again, once Middle Tennessee scored that touchdown, I, I kind of just knew there's there's no way they were going to be able to do it. No way you're going to drive down the field with two timeouts, I think about a minute and a half remaining. And, you know, they almost did, but almost isn't enough. You know, no. you lost the game. You had plenty of opportunities, plenty of momentum. And, you know, they just make bad mistakes, bad you know, disastrous plays at times. And I'm looking at it, it doesn't look so disastrous, you know, at the time, but looking back at those plays, you're like, man, like, if this goes differently, we're talking about a UTEP win. Yeah, that, that's a good point, too. It, there's just so many little things that could have led to a UTEP win when it was all said and done. And yes, they were without Cam Thomas. They didn't have Skyler Locklear. They didn't have Lucas Matamoros up front on their offensive line. They have in- injuries all over the field, but there's injuries all across college football. That's just the reality of November football. You have injuries. Those things happen. It's how you adjust after the fact and how you still try to pull off and win games. I'll tell you this, guys. The minor optimist, the UTEP fan who is saying, okay, no, 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 glass half full. I'm still bought in on this program. I'm still all about this team. They're going to argue this, and I'm going to ask you what you would say, Sal, because you, you do a good job of, of uh, blocking out some of the you know naysayers or some of the haters or some of the positive guys, okay? So if I was somebody with a glass half full and said, man, UTEP right now – had a chance to compete against a team in Conference USA and win. They had a lead all the way. They, they were leading all the way into the fourth quarter, and they were doing it with a true freshman quarterback. What more can you ask for in year one of a head coach who's taking over a program that is an absolute rebuild? What would you say to that? I would say, was this in the first quarter of the Conference USA schedule, or is this coming up near the end of the season where you've had a lot of time to make improvements and you haven't made those improvements? The latter. If it's the latter, then, um, I mean, you would expect a win if you've been in situations like that before. But we, we've seen them be in close games and not really come out. The, the only one that stands out, obviously, is the one win against FIU, which kind of looked like they were turning the corner there. They were converting. They were uh, The defense was on fire, and, and they've been on fire uh, for a good stretch. But uh, long story short, I know I went on a big old ramp, but I'd be like, come on, man. It's it's November. How do you not have it figured out? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are taking that, uh, taking that one away as well and thinking, okay, well, you want to see improvement. Um, but when you don't have wins and you don't have points to show for it, then improvements are hard to really prove. Uh, other than defensively, what I've seen defensively is improvements. So, and you know what, too, Adrian, to that point, there was extra preparation time with the game being last oh, week as well. So th- there's been a lot of time to improve since then. Good point. Let's uh, keep it moving. It's Ronnie, friend of the program, joining us next, 915-505-6009. Ronnie. Good evening, man. What's happening? Ronnie, you there? Ronnie, did did you put yourself on mute? Did we lose you? Did we lose you there, Ronnie? Can you hear me? We can hear you now perfectly. Let's let's hear it. Oh, man. Where do we start? I remember a couple weeks ago I told you that if UTEP moves to Kennesaw State, there's not a single push that should be returning to campus and now it looks like a realistic possibility um hey they beat uh liberty by the way i know that's why i said it's a realistic possibility uh you know i want to ask you guys a question what we're seeing right now is this an indication um for sky and and and, and, and being a first-year coach or is this an indication of what Dana Bill left the program. Oh, great question. okay i'll answer this after your call i want to hear your full take on just your thoughts on the game today Okay. Um, UTEP's awful. I mean, what else can I say, man? I mean, they're just not good, you know? And I said I said this a couple weeks ago, too. We're in a trial and error where people have to prove, uh, players, coaches, the latter, that they should be going to uh, the Mountain West and they should be a part of this program. And Scotty's got to get in the portal. He's got to recruit. He's got to get a different caliber 
of athlete from a mindset, uh, from a physical standpoint. They just have to have more because you don't want to just wake up in the Mountain West in two years and go, okay, now we're going to start recruiting. Like, you got to start that recruiting now. You got to start to lay that culture and foundation now so that when you go in, you know, you can have the, the ups and downs that you'll have from transition to a conference. But, I mean, you know, like I said, great story is when he took the job, he had no idea if he was going to Mountain West. When Senator Hyman had no idea if he was going to Mountain West. The problem with that is, it's realistic. We're going to the Mountain West. So things change. Things change quickly. UTEP will be a much more coveted place, I believe, amongst recruits. But it'll be up to Scotty and staff. They should be scarring the portal now. They should be looking and identifying kids that they want to start to get on visits uh, for basketball season, for popular basketball games, get into town, get into their homes, because it has to start now. That's no disrespect to the 85 minors that are on scholarship now, but I don't think there's more than maybe five that I think that I would bring into the Mountain West. you got to hit the pipeline. you got to hit it hard. you got to hit it now. You know, there was a question that was asked, Ronnie, what does UTEP have to sell to rec- recruits who are currently visiting campus right now? Like, I would say they actually have an advantage. They see the product on the field. They see the be- beautiful stadium. They see 14,000 fans or whatever that number was in attendance for a team that was 1-7 in seven going into this one, 1-8 one in eight exiting. Uh, I would say that's probably what you have to sell to recruits right now, that, hey, you could do something here in El Paso that's really never done before, have been done before at the football level at least. No, I agree. That's a great selling point. Um, the problem is everybody wants instant satisfaction and gratification now, right? These kids are part of the LeBron era where they want to link up with their buddies and win one, but two, but three, and four, and five, and six titles. Um, so you have to show them just enough winning that it makes them feel like you're the program they should choose as opposed to the other programs that are recruiting them that are probably on the winning side of things. Um, but you got to show them how they fit within your system, within your culture, within your scheme, so that they can have that individual accolade success that every kid, every parent, every coach, and every uncle is, is telling the kid, you know, that he is going to the NFL, right? So you got to show them where they fit in exactly and how they're going to make a difference. But you still have to bring a winning culture um, to kids when you go on the in-home visits, when they come on campus. you got to show them something tangible because you're you're like – the, the, the bad part is when you're not winning, you're one and seven, one and eight, whatever your record is, you're literally recruiting against everybody who is, let's just talk about the teams that are six and six, right? That are playing in bowl games, right? Let's not even talk about the teams that are going to the playoffs, right? So it's just very, very difficult to get the caliber of player that you need when you're in the basement, right? Uh, I don't care what conference you're in. That's what I'm saying. Like, you got to show the kids something so they feel like okay you know what you're doing because these kids nowadays they don't believe what they're told they believe what they see and you can tell them hey i wanted the fcs level but if you were losing in the fbs level guess what that's what they saw that's what they remember so those would be my takeaways all right great stuff ronnie as always man it's great to hear uh hear your voice are you gonna make it next week or are you gonna make it for the utep twofer uh utep football and utep men's basketball or are you gonna save your trip to el paso for men's basketball season what, what's I'm, the plan i'm saving it for for q1 of the men's basketball season I don't there we go see, i don't seem to need to see utep lose to kennesaw state i don't need to see that okay i i get it uh the trip has been sidetracked we'll see you in q1 uh there's a lot of great games for men's basketball so we'll see you then but great stuff, Ronnie. Appreciate it as always, man. Uh, we got to answer his question first. We got full phone lines. We got a bunch of people who are calling in. But uh, let's do it. Let's let's talk about the question that he posed, and I'll I'll throw it right there. He said. One and eight. UTEP is one and eight. Is that a reflection of this being a first year head coach in Scotty Walden? Or is this a reflection of what Dana Dimmel left behind? Sal, how would you answer this one? Uh I don't know, man. It, it, I don't want to say it's all one. I think it's kind of a mixture of both. Some of the best players did leave, but look at what we've been seeing this year. It's, it's kind of the same results, uh, you know, game in and game out. I mean, them losing to Southern Utah is is that Coach Dimmel or is that Scotty Walden as well, right? We could we could go on and on and on all season, but like I said, it's both, but it has to lean more one way, and I think it's on Walden. 
I think so too. I think um, when you really break it down, to have like excuses, all oh, this is what Dana Dimmel left behind. The Dana Dimmel experience didn't work. That, that that's how I see it right here. It just didn't work. So what the co- or what the athletic department decided to do was turn the page and say, okay, this didn't work. Let's try something else. And what Scotty Walden wanted to do is he wanted to have his roster, his own guys, his team, and so that's why you saw a lot of incoming guys, a lot of newcomers, and then a lot of guys leaving the program, whether they were going off to another school where they're playing at a Power 4 level or even another Group of 5 school right now, or not playing at all. Maybe they've transferred but not playing whatsoever. And then on the flip side, UTEP ended up bringing a lot of these newcomers, and we've praised a lot of these newcomers. I mean, talk about Dorian Hopkins today. He was UTEP's best player. He had 11 total tackles. He had a sack, two tackles for losses, and an interception. But Zay, how would you answer that one right there if you had to be of a first-year head coach or is it a reflection more of what the previous coaching staff left behind well i'm going to take you back to january 10th of 20 of earlier this year where i got a dm from a former utep coach he was on the staff with dana dimmel and he dm'd me on twitter i I haven't released this because i was hoping to release it in a different light but sadly you know he texted me clown emoji he said Keep signing 1AA players. You'll see the results next fall. If you or anyone else thinks 1AA players can play in Conference USA, you're as stupid as your post. 15 Austin people. And, I mean, what That's we're a seeing... a harsh comment, by yeah, the way. Yeah, what we're seeing now is, you know, it's true, right? It can, can, can Austin P, P players, guys like, you know, I guess J.P. Pickles and Austin P commit, but, but the FBS level... And I guess I'm leaning towards, this is really Scotty's first year. I'm going to go with that answer. I think Dana Dimmel left the program not great. He didn't leave it amazingly, but they were 3-9. and nine. There was talent all over this roster. We knew that last year. And, you know, Scotty's head coaching woes at times may have cost UTEP some games, right? We can look at the Louisiana Tech game. We can look at the Southern Utah game. And we can look at today. You know, his inexperienced as a FBS head coach, both on the recruiting trail and on the field, have cost UTEP at least a game or two this season. So I'm going to go with it's Scotty's first year, not Dana Dimmel, how he left his program. You know, I'll say this on the roster decisions because a lot of people have pointed this out to me and said, hey, you know, you, this is what happens when you bring a lot of FCS teams to UTEP. I'd say this to the older players who are on this team from Austin P. I have no fault to them. Like the juniors and seniors who moved over and who are playing, who are starting and who are helping this team out. Like take Brendan Smith. I mean, he's just a mainstay on that offensive line. But at least he gives some stability there. I think stability at certain positions is more valuable to this UTEP football team versus whatever anything else could have happened. And to have your whole team have a complete roster overhaul, I think that's another product of it being a first-year head coach. That's that's to that answer again. It's a first-year head coach. This is his first time with these guys at this level. So uh, for the Austin P guys like Javon Jackson, that's the that's the guy you hope to bring back for that final season as a senior next year, and that he has like an conference type of season but uh sal any other way that you'd want to answer this one now hearing from zay and hearing my thoughts right here i I mean i I think in terms of uh fcs players succeeding at the fbs level we know that they could go out uh, fcs can go out there and beat a fbs not just southern utah to utah we see it every single year and it happens you know by the dozens but i think Skill players more than likely can, but when it comes to the trenches, offensive line, defensive line, um, there, there's a big size and speed advantage when it comes to the trenches for a FBS. So, you know, some can slip through the cracks. I mean, we see JUCO players sometimes, uh, D3 players sneak into the NFL, right? It definitely happens, but in general, if you want to compete, you got to be able to uh, to bolster up that line. And if we're being honest, Mountain West players are probably going to be bigger in the trenches than they are in conference. USA. I understand that it may help with recruiting, but I'll go back to what I said before on one of the previous minor talks. UTEP was basically in this uh, new Mountain West that they're joining before, and we see we saw them, you know, in the bottom third of the standings when it came to football. Good point, Alberto. Anything you want to clean up here? 
No, yeah, it's definitely just Scotty Walden filling into his role. It's a, a new position for him. And what is he supposed to do? You know, in that first year, you, you, you're not supposed to bring over or overhaul a large portion of your roster from your old school. You you assume, right, as, as an incoming head coach, that a lot of the players that were there under the old regime are going to leave or are going to seek other you know, new horizons. So I understand the moves he made in the offseason to bring over the roster that he had. Those are your guys, so it makes sense. But uh, it's definitely... Definitely him, like Zay said, filling into the role. Okay, let's keep it moving. Shoe fan twelve at Fun and Fiery eleven tweets into the program. Such a disappointing loss. I thought Pickles did a great job of coming in, and that linebacker Diamond was all over the field making plays. Again, defense is okay. Offense can't get it going. Getting a little nervous about Tennessee. Getting a little nervous about Tennessee. Getting a little nervous. I'm getting a little nervous about next week. I'm getting a little nervous about Mondays. You know, are, is Skylar Lockley going to be cleared to play at quarterback? Does it even matter? Kind of like what Rob said earlier. It doesn't. Does it even matter at who's the quarterback here moving forward? Despite the inexperience that Pickles might have, uh, you know, going into this week. Leo underscore minor fan. I'm not mad about how they actually let Pickles throw the ball. It felt more like an offense, in my opinion. Maybe Pickles can continue to grow if they keep him at quarterback. I didn't like how Coach Walden ended the first half. Hashtag picks up for Pickles power. Mm, Good stuff, dude. Uh, And then he said, happy belated birthday to Adrian. Happy birthday, Alberto. No late game today, and it's a Saturday night. That's good stuff. Memo, year in and year out, we will be them once again. We are on to next year. The Texas Truth. I really liked what I saw from J.P. Pickles as for the loss. What can you expect from a team playing a true freshman quarterback at a high school who's starting in their first FBS football game? Go Miners. Back to the phone lines we go. 915-505-6009. George Guardado is joining us next, our intern on the phone lines. George, it's great to hear from you, albeit it's over the phone, not in person, which I'd rather it be, but uh, great to hear from you. Give us your takes on this one, your instant reaction. UTEP loses to Middle Tennessee 20-13. to Okay, hello? George? Hello, yeah. No, this is George. Oh, this is George. This is Zay's Pops. This is Zay's Pops. (laughs) What up, George? It's great to hear from you, my man. What's going on? It's all all, hey, what's up, dude? Uh, It's great to hear hear you guys. Uh, It was was a great takeaway. Uh, I have one thing, uh, a couple of things to say. I'm, uh, as it's Scotty Walden, a little bit of it, I have to agree. It's going both ways for me. You know, um, Starting uh, a true freshman like J.P. Pickles, as much bless his heart, he tried all he could uh, to to get some good su- success. Uh, I do agree with uh, the fact that we went for a field goal and not not try to punch it in. We we just um, at the end of the of the second quarter, uh, that was kind of disappointing. Uh, that that punt that pinned us at the five yard line, that was just. I, if I were to have been the, the special teams coach, I would have probably um, had him fake it and, and let it maybe fall in the end zone. Uh, I don't think they would have been able to, to do something with it. Uh, that was horrible field position. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I want to look forward to next season. And I agree with you guys. He has to do something about the the recruiting it has to be no more FBS FCS players he has to look for a different caliber player I I, I just don't see the talent there. Yeah, and I don't know if we're ever going to really see what what kind, or I'm I'm just saying here I'll say this George. I wonder what this next philosophy, how much it changes, you know, from the off season. And I'll say this: of the guys and the newcomers outside the Austin P guys, like don't get it twisted, guys. A lot of these other players who came into UTEP were Division One players, like FBS players, uh, who are making a difference on this team. Um, you know, some of the players that I'm looking at here, right in front of me, I'm looking at guys like, uh, you know, Adam Jacklin. He played for North Texas. I'm looking at uh, Nate, or excuse me, Dorian Hopkins. Last year, he played for Tulsa. You know, they had guys who played on FBS rosters who moved over. I'm just curious to see how much their philosophy changes in recruiting moving forward 
in the offseason. And I'll even say this. The freshmen have really panned out. Zay, what if they just go all in on the class of 2025 and say, hey, we want to be a school that helps develop a lot of freshmen. I like the true freshmen that we've seen so far. I'm just going to be honest with you. Yeah, me too. You know, I am definitely more of a, you know, proven Division One FBS and a freshman guy as opposed to the JUCO level and the FCS ranks. And that's just me. I just think you're, you're getting more of a, a sure thing when you have uh, a guy coming from an FBS uh, college, uh, you know, rather than someone who's coming from the FCS ranks or the JUCO ranks. And we've seen the JUCO ranks you know, with Dana Dimmel and that recruiting philosophy, it, it it can work. It really does work at times, but I just think you should put all your resources and everything you got on somebody proven. You know, a quarterback proven, a receiver proven, a halfback proven. Offensive line. Offensive line is probably the biggest one, right? Because we've seen how bad this offensive line can be at times. And I got to give them their credit. They really have gotten better throughout the course of the season. But I do think that, you know, this upcoming transfer portal or this recruiting cycle that's coming up in the off season, you're really going to see that, that drastic change that, Hey, we're going to go after guys from one, the state of Texas, two that have come from the FBS level and have experience rather than, you know, going all in on those Austin P guys and I get it right you got to put a roster together somehow and they lost a lot of scholarship numbers you know that that last cycle so getting those Austin P guys it's pretty easy and and who knows right maybe some of them can develop into really really good players I'm not saying that but I am saying that if you're going to go and out and get 16 FCS players again chances are it may not you know work out well for you uh, a couple other tweets to get to. Uh, good stuff, George. I appreciate the phone call. Let's keep it moving. 915-505-6009. Augustine is next, and then Memo after him. If you want to weigh in, we've got one phone line available. 915-505-6009. Diet Coke at Diet Coke 915. A timeout after an incompletion is wild. And this guy wants a Sun Bowl sellout. Jordan Palmer probably is shaking his head right now. I feel bad they even had to witness that. Embarrassing. Hashtag minor talk uh great to see the 2004 the team of 2004 by the way uh love to see that team get honored a lot of great names on that team and uh, a lot of them were here at the sun bowl so he just mentioned jordan palmer but we saw a lot of them johnny lee higgins howard jackson uh i i'm not naming everybody but um just a great team 2004 utep they honored them at halftime i felt like they could have honored them every quarter and that would have been pretty cool as well uh pick my axe 915 Young coach with a lot of a lot to learn. Minor fans wanted this. That time management would, uh, management was putrid. Walden and Pickles did a good job getting them into position to score, but just not enough. Augustine, who's going to be joined with us next. Let's hear all the excuses that there are for yet another L. It doesn't matter if there was a freshman quarterback he had time to prepare. Walden had an idea of how to use the offense. Stop with the excuses. This is the Minor Pickaxe Pod. Podcast. Shout out to those guys. Terrible pass interference call on Josiah Allen to give Middle Tennessee a walk-in touchdown. Offense wasn't as efficient as they needed to be. Defense did well, and so did special teams outside of the one missed field goal. Not a bad outing for true freshman quarterbacks first start jp pickles also we appreciate listening to you guys hopefully we can cross paths if you all travel to cruces for the last game of the season hashtag minor talk hashtag pick uh minor pickaxe podcast good stuff guys uh we we will go out there to las cruces so uh you got to come find us and say what's up this is from poncho at poncho dh Another winnable game dropped. Def- uh, defense continues to keep them in the game. Offense showed improvement under Pickles. They need to open up the playbook to more than five plays. At least the game was entertaining. Flabiano is still a subpar kicker. That is what he had to say. Little Badger, we may have found our future quarterback. Pickles did great today for being a true freshman and getting a little over a week of snaps with the first team. The kid stood there, took hits, and was not afraid to push the ball down the field. Gave me Jordan Palmer vibes. <laughs> Hashtag minor talk. Okay, I can't get there. Come on, man. You're asking, you're talking to me about the second all-time leading passer in Utah history? It gives you Jordan Palmer it's, feels? Come on. It's not even that. These guys are just completely different. I think Jordan Palmer... They're 
Homer once. They're completely once. different. His longest run, I can't remember. It was like UAB or something, and it was amazing, but it was okay. a broken down play, and you could see him running out of gas like at the 30-yard line. Okay. <laughs> so completely different. So I need to do the J.P. Pickles stuff right now because I, I, I want to get to Augustine and Memo. We're going to get to them in just a second, but we'll be quick about this, guys. Uh, J.P. Pickles, how do you evaluate his first start? I, I'm so jealous of this take right here by Drew Bonney. Drew Bonney was the one um, who, who came up with this one, but he had, he said, does J.P. Pickles remind you of Calvin Brownholtz? I said, oh, no, not really. But then I really thought about it. I was like, wait a second. We saw Calvin Brownholtz as like a sophomore, redshirt sophomore who had already had like a little bit of JUCO experience, right? So is this like true freshman Calvin Brownholds? I did the digging, guys, okay? So here's J.P. Pickle's stat line today. 18 of 33, an interception, 145 passing yards, a rushing touchdown, and 77 rushing yards, okay? Here is Calvin Brownholds' first FBS start, okay? 11 for 24, so he was right around the same percentage as J.P. Pickles. He was 45% in completion, 189 passing yards right there for J.P. Pickles, two touchdowns, two interceptions, one rushing touchdown, and 51 rushing yards. What do you think, Sal? Any thoughts? Any comparisons? J.P. Pickles to Calvin Brownholtz. I'm jealous. I love it. Oh, that that's a good one. Um, but I got to disagree just to, for the sake of disagreeing. Keep okay, it. okay. Tell I, me. I, I think they're a bit different. I think, um, obviously, with with Pickles, the way that he runs is a bit harder. He's kind of more like a like a tight end playing quarterback. I, if that make like a slim tight end playing quarterback, and with Brownholtz, it, it kind of looked more like um, like a video game player out there that you just throw in there and a figure like it out. Like Blake Bell, like the Belldozer, <laughs> you know, with Oklahoma, yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, Zay, any thoughts? You don't like it? Well, you know, if Calvin Brownholtz is you know, your comparison, then I'm not looking forward to the J.P. Pickles era. Oh, wow. No, but, oh, wow. I mean, they, they do play <laughs> similar. I definitely see, you know, where, where you can get that one from. But I, I just think Calvin Browns was he was a little better. He was just a little better in all facets of the game, especially passing the this ball. Is, this is J.P. Pickles' first game, though. Yeah, right? this is J.P. Pickles' first game. So if we were seeing a true freshman Calvin Brown holds – it, it may have been a little similar. I think it could okay. have been a little similar. Okay, let's keep it moving. Augustine's next. We lost Memo. Sorry about that, Memo. Augustine, <laughs> good evening, man. What's happening? Give us your thoughts. Hey, everybody. Good uh, Good evening. I just have a couple questions for you guys, and, and I tend to disagree with, with, with Pickles. I think he looked great for his first outing. He looked really well, but here's the thing. My question to you is, and I, I think you guys answered it a little. There's been no improvement in the offense. There's, there really hasn't, barring, you know, injuries and all that. I mean, defense, it's easier. It's always easier to destroy than to build. But there's been no, no improvement at all. So here's my question. Is, uh, is also the Walden experiment a failure? Because... I'll say this much. Where is he going to recruit from? What talent is he going to recruit if his only experience was FCS talent? So it's a it's a valid question, but I would say this. To temper your uh, panic meter right now, uh, Augustine, it's just year one, and they did prove that they had the number one recruiting class in 2024. And you might ask, well, where do they get all these players? You know, they only have the FCS uh, prowess, like you just mentioned, as far as experience goes, at the head coaching spot. Well, Scotty Walden went out and got Texas guys. He went out and got guys who were in the transfer portal. Some of them were FCS guys. Some of them were FBS guys. But he kind of got a little mixed bag of everybody. And he did it through the high school ranks. The class of 2024 was the top recruiting class of Conference USA. I get it. It's Conference USA. But you still have the likes of Liberty in this conference that takes football very, very seriously, especially recruiting uh, at that level. So if you're asking me where specifically, it's going to be across the state of Texas, like Zay was saying earlier. As far as improvement goes, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I liked Pickle's game. I liked I liked what they threw out there. But I tend to agree with what Rob said earlier, uh, Augustine. I think that it doesn't really matter the quarterback here right now. It matters more about kind of the schemes or the situation that the offense is put in. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you there. And this is my, my, my take on, uh, 
or my my jab at Scotty Walden. He has not let let his his offense be his offense. He hasn't gone to you know to the these uh, plays that he's known for. He hasn't either. He doesn't have confidence in the players, or he doesn't have confidence in himself to actually pull those plays off. And that's that really either of those options is really scary. I mean, I have to agree with you, man. I have to actually agree. Good phone call, Augustine. I appreciate it, man. I thought you got you had some good takes today. Uh, so you swung in the right direction. Good stuff. I appreciate the phone call, Augustine. Thanks for weighing in on the program. 915-505-6009. Uh, to that point, there's a couple other tweets to get to. This is uh, from Tim at TSIBS. Uh, 2167. Horrible time management to end the first half and end the game. Not taking timeouts. Walden play calling sucks. Same stupid screens and runs up the middle that got nowhere. This excitement that he was bringing, going to get blown out and embarrassed at Tennessee. Front page sports UTEP. If you notice, UTEP has started to focus on a lot of Juco players recently. Usually means the head coach is looking for more experienced guys rather than just freshmen out of high school. A quicker fix, but doesn't mean it's it's uh, meant for sustained success because you only get those players for a year or two. Uh, this is from Mr. Rod 3337778. Disappointing loss, but we have to remember that Pickles was never supposed to play this year. It's still a winnable game, though. I'll say this. We've seen three quarterbacks run the offense this season, each with a different style, and they can't put up points. That's on the coach. Uh, this is coming in right now from Memo, who we missed on the phone lines. QB1, QB2, and QB3. There is now, unfortunately, too long of a time to figure out QB1. We'll see glimpses of QB3, but is this really our future? Um, it's a good question right there, Memo. Is J.P. Pickles the quarterback of the future? Guys, there's no way of telling. They have Skyler Locklear yeah. for another year or two or three because he was a redshirt sophomore, so he can technically play two more years, essentially. You have Cade McConnell for at least one more year, right, if he's able to get that medical hardship. Then you also have J.P. Pickles, who's a true freshman. Shea Smith, who's a true freshman. Sal, there's no way to tell who's the tr- who's the quarterback of the future for UTEP. Yeah, and, and going into to the end of the season, right, if, if let's say one and two, hypothetically, let's just throw it out there. Let's say they're not here no more, and we'll just say they're both seniors. I don't know, whatever the case is. Now let's let's bring it down to Pickles and Smith. Well, it's kind of hard to get a true gauge on it because the sample size for uh, Pickles is going to be a lot larger than the sample size for Shea Smith. So I think we are going to see Shea Smith start a game, you know, one of the final three. And we'll see Pickles assuming that, uh, you know, that one and two are, uh, aren't are in the rest of the season. So th- that's what I take away from it. Unfortunately, just some mismanagement within the first half of the season that went on, on, uh, you know, playing Shea Smith early, in my opinion, kind of a uh, Robs the opportunity of seeing what that's like. No, I totally agree with that right there. Uh, Zay, any thoughts? Is uh, you know, I don't know if we can find out at the end of the season who the starting quarterback for UTEP will be in the future. Yeah, you know, I really don't know who it is, but I do have, I do hope that they go out in the off season and recruit a proven quarterback from the JUCO ranks, from you know the FCS ranks, the FBS ranks, somebody who has played college football before and has shown that they can play because that's what you need right I think that's what you need regardless if it's Skyler K JP or Shea coming back you need somebody that that has experience has done it before and and you know we see it everywhere right Sam Houston State's Juco quarterback right he he came in automatic he won the starting job and and he's just good right Diego Pavia he was a Juco guy he won a national championship at the Juco level he came in and he was good so you need a proven quarterback at, at there and whether that's Cade McConnell who has won some games in the past if he can come back again and and really get a a full fair job before getting injured or something like that or if it's a Juco transfer portal guy I just want to see that happen what do you think about the Juco situation? situation, Alberto, because that one is one of those right there that fans, naysayers, I should say, not uh, uh, fans, I don't want to characterize that right there. I'd say naysayers would say, oh, well, UTEP's already tried that experiment out with Dana Dimmel, and they've already done the JUCO route. What would you say to them? Well, it's kind of changed a little bit now because uh, money's involved. So I think that the miners might actually struggle a little more now in getting guys out of the JUCO realm. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. If they're a truly um, reputable guy in the JUCO realm and they're getting looks from other schools, 
Well, other schools might be willing to put down a little money, and if UTEP doesn't have the money to do so, well, then they're out of that equation. And I'll talk a little bit about the recruiting class that you guys were talking about and the quarterback as to, you know, this whole J.P. Pickles, who's going to be the quarterback of the future. In that 2025 class, they have a two-star quarterback at 6'3 from Cibolo, Texas, Chad Warner. So That's the one everybody likes. Exactly. That's the one all the UTEP Twitter keeps raving about, Chad Warner, all the throws. Zay, are you in? You know, I, we won't know until it's he, too he, early. Yeah. Are you telling me you're trying to evaluate senior film? Uh, yeah. That's what some UTEP fans are doing on Twitter, though. It, it's tough, and you it's know, too early. I'll say this again: UTEP was was going after Cameron Dyer from from New Mexico for the longest time. I mean, Chad Warner was always their second option. Let's be you know blunt about it; he was always their second option. And Cam Dyer is not even going to play quarterback at the next level. So, you know, uh, I think. Chad Warner, he's really, really good at Cibolo Steel. That's a powerhouse of the program. That's a winning program, and he obviously has something about his game that that, that UTEP really likes, but I don't think that we're going to see Chad Warner come in year one and automatically, you know, steal a starting job away from from anybody who who is still at that you know quarterback position next year. Well put. Let's go back to the phone lines. Richards next on the phone lines now in five five zero five six zero zero nine. We'll get into a little minor talk UTEP basketball preview here in just a little bit. Uh, but before we do that, let's go out to Richard. Richard, uh, good evening, man. What's going on? Hey, good evening, guys. Hey, first and foremost, love the show, man. Love, uh, love listening. Love listening in after the after the games, man. So appreciate. Thank it. Thank you. Thanks for saying that, Richard. We appreciate you for listening and for calling into the program. Uh, give us your thoughts on this game. Well, I was I was the Mister Rod tweet, right? So this is this is the third quarterback, fourth quarterback, if you uh, if you include Smith, I think for a snap or two earlier this season. But each each one of these guys has a different style, right? I mean, Skylar Lockyer is kind of a uh, a run pass guy, Kate McConnell's kind of a pocket passer guy, and then uh, Pickles is more of a, a run first guy. You know, so we've seen every every style of quarterback you can see. You know, in an offense, and and they're still not putting up points. You know, so I got to start looking at Coach a little sideways, man. Like like, what's he doing? He's he's probably got to revise everything, and uh, it's going to be a, a quarterback roulette for next season. You know, I just I, I does the quarterback make a difference in your eyes? Uh. Absolutely, right? Because that, that quarterback style kind of dictates your offensive philosophy, right? Am, am, I, am I tripping there? That's a good point. I, I like that argument. I like your, your pushback to me because it, it kind of does dictate. It, it's got to be the guy with some moxie and some swagger, too, for whatever UTEP is asking this quarterback to do. And I, I'll i give Skylar Locklear, in our Say Something Nice About Skylar Locklear segment, he had a little bit of that moxie and swagger that you kind of need uh, to run this or a little bit of the flair that you need, I would say. And I don't think we saw it enough. We saw Cade McConnell enough to even say if he offered that for this offense and then and with J.P. Pickles, it's just one game. And Shea Smith, it's really just one or two pass attempts, and that's it. Right, and and that's a good point. But I guess I guess the best equalizer for that is, for all of those style of quarterback play, is the running game, right? And, and maybe the offensive line doesn't dictate that well enough. you know. So that might be the, the great equalizer there. Yeah, no, not, uh, no doubt, man. Good stuff, Richard. I appreciate the phone call, man. Thanks for weighing in on the show, and uh, thanks for listening here on the program as well. 915-505-6009. This is coming in from Front Page Sports UTEP. Don't forget, the BYU quarterback was already on UTEP's campus. Ooh, hey, a little uh, uh, recruiting nugget there, Zay. What about that, Sal? Um, getting a chance to have Jake Retzlaff, who was, uh, who was on his way to becoming a UTEP minor he was ready to go to El Paso and uh, his scholarship was yanked because of low grades in his junior college classes uh, he did not join uh, the BYU football team but that's an interesting one in itself who has already been on campus um, that would be interesting Jake Retzlaff um, who could uh, end up finding his way to the portal and then maybe get a chance to come to a school like UTEP? I guess it's way too early to even find out whether or not this is cool, or true, I should say. But, Sal, what do you think about UTEP going after a group of five, or maybe even, in this case, a power four bounce back at quarterback? I mean, other schools are doing it too, right? Why not Why not attack the portal? I mean, we talk about how UTEP is poached all the time, and all teams are poached, if we're being honest. But um, some of the better players that UTEP has, they leave other 
other places or um you know it might not work out academically at any school and these guys go other places and somehow some way you know they're able to get it together so i'm not against it you got to fill guys on your roster at some point and what coach walden was able to do um you know to to fill it up relatively fast if we're being honest i do got to credit that you don't you, it's rare it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it so to speak in that sense when it comes to numbers so a credit there but now it's it's elevation time year one just fill the roster year two build on that or um you know obviously get better uh this is from page sports utep if you had to answer this now would you say walden gets a second contract here or somewhere else as a head coach i it's so early to tell man it's so it's too early to tell on all that stuff i i don't want to just be a cop-out answer and say oh it's it's hard to say or whatever but it truly is i mean what you really want me to bank all this on a 50 50 guess my guess right here is that he gets another job as a head coach elsewhere because he's so young he's 34 years old I mean, despite whatever happens here at UTEP, Zay, I, I think that's a it's a hard question, maybe a little bit of an unfair question. I, I guess it's fair. It's fair to ask us anything since we're here on Minor Talk talking a ton of hypotheticals. Um, but still, I just think that, yes, he will. If I had to bank on anything, he gets maybe he gets a second contract as well. And he's also gets a, a, you know, a head coaching job elsewhere because he's only 34 years old. Yeah, yeah. Scotty Walden, he, the age is a big thing with him, right? You, you got to go. This is his first FBS head coaching job. He's won it everywhere he's been at. He says the right things, and and boy, can he recruit you know a pipeline. So, you know, I just want to go back to the to the Red Slap. I mean, I was in shock. I had to search this up because, I mean, everybody follows you know I guess Big Twelve football. I mean, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the BYU in, in, yes. in the Big Twelve right now. Like this so. is kind of shocking to me. So for him to. You know, he would have committed under the the Dimmel era. How different that may have, may have been, right? Because if he oh. if he was here last year, when Gavin goes down, and you have a guy like him waiting, you know, in in the ranks, but his scholarship gets pulled and this and the third. But you know, back to the Scotty Walden question, I was just I got sidetracked because. Wow, like that's a big UTEP what if that, that I just had no clue about. I had no clue about the Jake Ratzlaff what if as well. He's killing it for BYU right now. Yeah, let me clean it up. I, I kind of made it sound like he's he's coming on campus right now. He was on campus in the past with uh, the Dana Dimmel era, just like you mentioned there, Zay. And I'm looking at it right here. He went to Riverside, California. That's the tie right there. UTEP used to have a pipeline with Riverside uh, College, and now he found his way to BYU. And, uh, yeah. Rhett's laugh right now. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what ends up happening with his career. So good stuff. 8-0 as a starter, by the way, uh, this year with the Cougars. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's so hard. You think it's tough at the college level. It's tough at the NFL level. They, they, it's hard to evaluate quarterbacks at the highest level, and it's hard to see who's going to pan out and who's not. But uh, we went down an insane rabbit hole talking quarterbacks, but it's you know, it's. Um, I think it's warranted knowing that we had to evaluate a little J.P. Pickles today and just understand what he brings to the table. And I think fans wanted to give their thoughts as well. I think fans, I think we can all assess this, guys, especially you, Alberto. I think fans are okay with the performance from J.P. Pickles tonight. That's the big takeaway I have. And they want to see more from Pickles, whatever that means. I think Locklear, if he's cleared to play, he's their starting quarterback moving forward. But for J.P. Pickles, at least he shows something uh, – for fans to also desire something here in the future. Yeah, he shows a, a certain level of toughness that's uh, really desirable, I think, uh, from the minor fateful. He kind of finishes off plays like Tim Tebow. That's who he reminds me of, not uh, any former minor quarterbacks. But, yeah, he had a, a game today where he kind of really limited his his mistakes, and that's what the minors needed to keep themselves in contention. The defense played great. You're just not able to hang enough points up in there to actually win the game. And that's really been the story all season, and I think that's what's really been disappointing, right? You kind of hang in there in that uh, La Tech game out at La Tech. You have a, a great second half against Colorado State, giving yourself the idea that maybe you could have won with a different quarterback. And so it's just a, a season full of what ifs. We just had a what if segment. It's been a season full of what ifs. And so I think that's really what this uh, 
this this coaching staff is going to build on and just learning of, of, of all of these experiences because they needed this, these learning experiences. Uh, our telephone number now in five five zero five six zero zero nine. By the way, Minor Talk brought to you by Jack in the Box. Fifteen locations here in El Paso and Las Cruces open twenty four seven three sixty five. It's the perfect place before every game, after every game, uh, when there's not even a game going on. It's just the perfect spot to go to whenever you are looking for your next meal. That is Jack in the Box, one of our favorites here on Minor Talk as we continue. Special thanks to the District Pub and Kitchen West. We'll be out Monday after the UTEP basketball game. They take on Sol Ross. That is 32-33 North Mesa on El Paso's west side. That's the District Pub and Kitchen uh, as our home for Minor Talk watch parties and post-game parties as well. I also want to say this. A big shout out to the Oscar Addy at the Agency. They're doing a really cool thing for hometown heroes. They're going to actually uh, they want more hometown hero nominations. Visit their webpage riseup915.com learn more about what they do for hometown heroes and how they honor them at every football game and men's basketball game as well. Um, let's keep it moving. I do want to talk UTEP men's basketball but we still have phone calls to get to. 915-505-6009 Joe Chacon is next. Joe Chacon, it was great to see you earlier today. What's happening my friend? It was great to see you earlier today, and uh, I'm sure you had enough of me already. <laughs> no, we can never get enough Joe Chacon. In fact, we didn't get any tweets, so we had to get you on the phone. So it's great to hear from you, well, man. And it's funny because when I was at the district with you all, it felt like you got to call in, don't tweet. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it this one time, but the next time I'm going to be tweeting. So <laughs> he made he, he told me. Uh, let me, I, I just want to go over some points, and this is just for my overall experience have, after having been away for nine years from a UTEP home game. You know, I've watched all UTEP sports on TV from where I've been in Houston or California or Colorado. Um, first of all, wherever you go in this country, if you are wearing anything UTEP-related, El Paso is so unique that someone will approach you and say, what side of town are you from? And you know right away you're talking to somebody from El Paso. Isn't that the funniest that, thing that that's the first question? What side of town? You're, you're South Sider, the, you're, you're West Sider, you're Northeast, you're East Sider. What, what are you? And it doesn't matter where you are. And that's such a good thing. And that's, just, and that's what's wholesome about El Paso, which I, wanna, I, I really want to bring to emphasis is being at the district, seeing you guys, you have your crew, your crew has so much energy and fire. There is so much upside to what you guys are bringing to not just the community, but to UTEP athletics. So props to you, to Sal, to Alberto, to Zay, everybody that was there, you guys, I have never seen it. You guys were everywhere interacting with people you guys were talking you to sports it was nothing negative it was everything was positive and that's what you want now thank you man appreciate it give us your thoughts on the game i appreciate you the game was different it's so crazy to watch a game on tv and think you know what's going on i could actually sit in the stands and predict more in the stands what was going to happen the predictability factor, and, and I, don't want to, I don't want to take away from Coach Walden and the staff or whatever, but, you know, I was sitting there with my dad. I said, look at this. They're, gonna, they're, they're giving the middle open. The middle's open. What did t- Middle Tennessee? They were th- dumping it in the middle, dumping it in the middle. And it was just – it was very predictable defensively to see what was happening. And then they finally made an adjustment, and then there's an interception. But it was after a drive – you know, and it's it's you you would think from the if I can see it from, you know, eleven rows up, and you guys can see it from up there certainly. You know, those those are small adjustments, and I'm not going to take away from anything that the miners are doing now because with fourteen thousand people there, there was still a lot of energy in the crowd, a lot, and you know, coming from nine years ago when the last time I saw a game, you know, there was twenty thousand people on the stands. You know, there's 6,000 less for this game, you know, but it still got loud. There was still people showing emotion. You know, this team has a heartbeat in El Paso. It's there. And I think people are too quick to judge 
on what is happening. And I, I've, I haven't really voiced this, but, you know, Scotty Walden brought in a lot of his players from Austin P. You know, you're, you're playing a lot of FCS players against, you know, FBS players. And it, it, it kind of shows, you know, not, not just with the, the experience, but, you know, when they get tired or, you know, at, at, towards the end of the game, it's, it's their dragon. And with the recruits that are going to come in, I really do think the energy that's there, the energy that you guys are going to be continue pumping in, I can't not see us not having 20 plus thousand people every game next year. And I'm, 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 I'm not skeptical. I'm hopeful. Like this is just me coming in from completely outside of the realm. Like first time I get to see everything. What was really sad for me was my old tailgate spot, the parking lot between like the village Inn and, hmm. and where the district was. Yeah. Now you have to pay. It's a pay lot. Yeah. Like, that used to be, that used to be, that used to be ground zero for all the tailgates. You get in there, <laughs> everybody would do their thing, and it was empty. Like nobody wants to pay ten or fifteen dollars to sit there. But when, I'll, I'll tell you, you this, can... Joe. I'll tell you that. Hey, and I appreciate the phone call, man. We got to get to a couple other calls because we got full phone lines again. Um, but I appreciate it. I just say this: that uh, when this town and when the city is bought into this program it's some special things can really happen i love when you see the graphics of utep's attendance compared to mountain west attendance the fact that they had forty six thousand just two years ago uh for that um north texas home opener it's things that you kind of take for granted when you really think about it yeah. the fans always show up sal we've always uh be you know we've uh, talked about this narrative right there it's just the team doing their part right there and as far as the tailgates go i think the tailgates are rocking especially that area when the team is has some excitement to build on, even if it's that first game and you're going to pack 40,000-plus in attendance. And, and you know what? The excitement for the Mountain West, um, in reality, it's there for basketball more than it is for football, but we'll switch it back over to football. It, it, it might be jumping early on, but guaranteed, if they have 35-plus, 40,000-plus, and they drop a game to whoever they're playing that they should be, expect it to be the same as what's going on right now because you might – hypothetical, we don't know the schedule. Let's say they have Wyoming at home, uh, one of their early games, and fans are excited, 40,000-plus. You lose to Wyoming, and then you got to play Hawaii later on that year, you're probably going to get 9 or 10. It's all about them winning the games. Fans have shown up. It's time for the football team to show up. You have about one and a half years or so. Um, to, to get it together before you jump into that better conference that rightfully, I mean, there's other teams who deserve to be there more than UTEP. Geography plays a role in this, but oh my gosh. They made it work. Either way, they somehow made it work uh, on all of this. So uh, let's keep it moving. Two calls to get to, 915-505-6009. This show will never end. Joe Fan is next up with us. Joe Fan, it's great to hear from you. Long time no talk. I've owed you like five calls already. Uh, I It's on me, man, but it's great to hear from you on Minor Talk. How's everything going? Oh, doing the best we can, that's for sure. Listen, I, the only reason why I called in is because I was surprised. All your fans have made some great points. But uh, the one thing I, I didn't hear anybody say was, you know, everybody questioned about the timeout he called after the incomplete pass. And watching it on TV, the reason why, I believe, is because the Pickles got killed on that pass. He got hammered in the chest and got knocked down, and therefore that's why he called timeout. He had to give the kid a breather. I think that's a good one right there. I think you're you're exactly right. But my my argument was Joe Fan. He was JP Pickles on that entire drive. He was throwing his entire body out there. Like it wasn't just that play where right. he got killed and got crushed. It was like two plays before that where he took a scramble and then he he got hit hard. I mean right. credit to him for laying his body on the line. And, and that's and what I like about on him. The last play of the game on that pass, there were so many mistakes made. Okay, first of all. The color analyst was excellent on CBS. Oh, course. Alex Brenneman. Because, yeah, he's awesome. And shout out to Alex first, Del Barrio. In that drive, he said when, when Pickles was running and wound up running for, uh, for some yardage, he said there was a UTEP player downfield that was wide open. So he gave him a pass on that, okay? Then a play, a play or two later, there was another play where he said 
the kid, the, the kid scrambles out, and there's another UTEP player wide open, and he says, you know, you got to look downfield. He, he went back and criticized him and said, hey, you got to look downfield. There's players open, okay? And then on the final drive, if you saw the replay, the, the pass he threw was wobbling. It was wobbling, okay? And I don't know if it was because of the fact of, like you said, all the hits he got or that last hit he got, okay? And and I think that was the reason why it was a wobble. And then he criticized again, again, like you guys said, it was maybe pass interference. But the kid was not in the end zone. Right. He was on the five-yard line. So what would, what would it have made a difference, any kind of difference? I mean, yeah, you get well, one more well, play. The, the difference was – that when he was, who, who was the wide receiver? Give it was good. Name. I think it was Goodman on that one. Okay. Yes, when Goodman was running across the field, the kid is running to the left, right to the same side as that kid. And as he threw the ball to him, guess what? The color analyst and me saw the same thing, which was he wasn't looking for the ball. How are you not running if you're running across the field and your quarterback? If they have a play that he's running to the left to buy time, right? How come is he not looking for the pass? And then when he finally looked up for the pass, well, by that time, the the, the linebacker kind of hooked him a little bit and then knocked the ball away because the ball was wobbling because I think the kid got hit on that last play I described first, okay, and he had nothing left in the tank to throw it 25 yards or 23 yards, wherever they were. Because, like I said, to me, the the kid never threw only one pass that he threw a distance of whatever it was, 18-yard completion. Everything was, like the fans said, was short. And when he threw that pass that everybody on TV and you guys were commenting that it was a great pass, my answer was it wasn't a good pass because it was in double coverage. And he got lucky that nobody intercepted it. And then when they did it again, not even, what, two or three plays later, the same kind of pass, what happened? It got deflected, and they made the interception. So I don't like his play calling. I don't like at all his the coaches. When you got two minutes left in the first half and you got two minutes left in the game, he don't know what to do. I don't. I can't understand a coach that's been coaching in Division Two and also coaching in Division One, whether he was an assistant or what he was. How you cannot have understand what to do on timeouts. Yeah, the clock management stuff is is stuff that uh, it, it makes you feel very, I guess, kind of reminiscent of what Dana Dimmel had because that was some of the same complaints that you had with them. Uh, great analysis and breakdown, Joe Fan. By the way, on the final drive for JP Pickles and what may have happened, kind of in that one. I liked your analysis also about you know what that what that pass really looked like and how it wasn't necessarily pass interference. But great stuff, man. It's always great to hear from you. I always appreciate to hear your takes. And uh, you know when I'm hearing from you, Joe Fan, it's always because we failed to point out one thing, and usually the thing that you point out is something that uh, needs to be, um, I guess, hammered home a little bit more. So great stuff, man. Really appreciate hearing from you. I owe you a phone call, and so expect one maybe this week here or uh, maybe next week if uh, if not this week. But either way, I'll catch up with you soon. Uh, let's keep it moving. Nine one five five zero five six zero zero nine. James from the east side of El Paso joins us next. After this, we're going to take a quick time mount and then we are going to do a little UTEP basketball pre uh, pregame or I should say preseason stuff and just give our thoughts on the team uh, this is coming from James James good evening man what, what are your thoughts uh, on this one to you guys uh, it's a great show and thank you for allowing us to voice and and vent our frustration uh, I have a couple of concerns number one and really it's a question for everybody is the game at this level just too fast for our coaching staff. And you look at just a lot of errors uh, like that. Why, don't, why not call a hot, uh, you know, like a hike? So when the guy was in, their, in our backfield, hike the ball. I mean, regardless, it would have been a free play. And uh, of course, and he was like pointing. Out. He was like pointing to the defense, and it's like, dude, this it doesn't work like that. JP Pickles, you have to snap the ball, and then they'll call a penalty. You can't just, exactly. you know, point exactly. to the defense. No, you're right. You have to. You have to hike the ball. You have to hike the ball. You're absolutely right. 
But one of my biggest concerns is um, the the safety of our players. You, you look at you look at the injuries that we have, but you look at the teams of the other teams that line up against us. I mean, certainly they're faster, they're quicker, they're bigger, they're stronger, and we have a long list of injuries. And I can't help but think, I mean, are these guys just are we just are we just too small for the division one? I mean, I don't know. I mean. Uh, it just seems like when the previous coach was here, I attended a lot of practices, a lot of practices. All the practices now are closed for the most part. But the biggest advantage and the biggest change we saw over the years was in the trenches. And the uh, guy that announces the football games, and I won't say his name, but we, that's, that's where we saw the most positive change. The size, and excuse my language, those big butts down there, they were huge. They were huge. And it's it's a real concern. The serious hits our guys are taking, our kids are taking. I mean, it's really concerning. But I'll, I'll leave that and let you guys answer. All right, man. I, I think I, I just, I just want to uh, add one final thing. Guys, let's go support the team. Let's try and get thirty five, forty thousand 40000 for next week's homecoming game, guys. I mean, let, we are El Paso. We can stay together. We can stick together. But let, let's go out there and support our – it's our team. Okay, thank man. thank you again, guys. You guys got do you. a great job. Hey, thank I appreciate you. it, man. Thanks so much, James. Thanks for the kind words about us and everything. And I, I just appreciate you uh, weighing in on the program. I, don't, I think we've said a lot of this stuff already. No need to hammer that home. But I appreciate James's call uh, to weigh in on the program. Let's do this. Let's take a timeout. We're long overdue for a timeout. You're listening to Minor Talk, presented by Jack in the Box. More, and we'll talk a little UTEP basketball here coming up next on 600 ESPN El Paso. Oh, we're having too much fun here as Minor Talk continues. Presented by Jack in the Box. I'm Adrian Bradis. We got Zay Galindo in the house. Sal Montes in the house. The birthday boy, Alberto Reta, in the house as well. Let's get out of here so he can enjoy his birthday. Uh, but as we wind it down, we're getting ready for UTEP basketball. And guys, this is a programming note. This is more to our listeners. Uh, but programming note for next Saturday, UTEP football, the final game at home, will be on our partner station, 95.5 KLAQ, uh, with the countdown to kick off starting uh, just like what you heard today. Actually, it'll start at 1 o'clock. Let's uh, be precise. Kickoff is at 2 out at the Sun Bowl, and then uh, that will all be on 95.5 KLAQ. On 600 ESPN El Paso, UTEP men's basketball has a very uh, significant road game. They take on Utah Valley next Saturday. It's a 2 o'clock tip-off. We uh, Colin Deaver will have the coverage right here on 600 ESPN El Paso. He'll be calling all the games uh, for actually he'll be calling this game, excuse me, uh, since there's a scheduling conflict, and he will be on with us here 600 ESPN El Paso to call that UTEP men's basketball game. And after UTEP men's basketball, we will do minor talk. So we are prioritizing a little UTEP men's basketball next week. Apologies to the UTEP football fans. We'll do cleanup at the end of the basketball segment for basketball, uh, minor talk, and we'll do football on top of that. So we'll get a little bit of a two for next week. UTEP men's basketball, UTEP football, both playing at the same time, the exact same time, 2 o'clock, and it'll be on 600 ESPN El Paso and on KLAQ. Zay, do you like our decision? Yeah, you know, I think it's the smartest decision to make in a situation like this. And, you know, this is an early home, um, an early road game for for the Utah basketball team. We're not, I'm not used to seeing that, you know, really that often. But, I mean, I guess we're already going to start with the negativeness on Utah basketball. At least I am. Utah basketball won't host a D1 opponent in the Don Haskins Center. So I think December seventh. I might yeah, be wrong. Seattle. But, Seattle. Yeah. So we're gonna have to wait a while to see some some real basketball in person, at least, which is. Sad, at least on the men's side. The women's side, it gets started early. You know, we're going to have a game at 11, I think, 11 a.m. against Charlton State on uh, on Monday for the UTEP women's basketball team. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, it's a doubleheader, Sal, on Monday. Me- women play in the morning, 11 o'clock. Um, we will uh, be on site to cover that game, so be sure to follow us, 600 ESPN El Paso on Twitter. And then the evening tip-off, Sal, it's 7 o'clock, and it's UTEP men's basketball. They are back in action. Sol Ross, where are you at, 
right now, expectations wise, because my expectations are high and they I feel like they're warranted. I feel like this UTEP men's basketball team needs to prove to the fan base, needs to show to the fan base that this run that they had at the CUSA yeah. tournament wasn't just an anomaly. It was actually legit and bringing back nine scholarship players, 10 overall when you include Antoine Holmes, a walk-on, it means something for continuity and it mean, and it's going to translate to success. That's my expectation for men's basketball. Yeah, and you got to see the uh, the improvement, right, from um, from 2022-23 to last year, 23-24. Granted, the difference is, what, about four wins or so? But you saw them strike um, when they got hot and they made it to the Conference USA Championship game uh, throughout that late run. So that's what, uh, that's what we're kind of judging them off of is, hey, you made it this far last year. Regular season record doesn't really matter too much now. You've tasted some postseason success. Can you extend that into the big dance? And there's no more, hey, just got to get the roster right. Hey, they just got to tweak a couple things to get the defense or the offense right. This is a veteran uh, coaching staff that the Miners have, and they also have a lot of players returning too. So the expectations have to be high. I don't want to do an over-under on wins because mm. I, I don't think it's going to matter too much. We want to see them back in the Conference USA Championship game and dare I say win it. I don't think that's too much to ask for when you have Coach Golding and a solid uh, solid core returning. Okay, Sal, I'm putting you on the spot. Over, under. Oh, uh, here we go. 20 wins. Over, under. Over. 20 wins. Over. Over. Over 20 wins. If it's under, I will throw my laptop out of the window <laughs> while driving on I-10. Going the speed limit. Going to speed limit. No, I'm just kidding. I'll go faster. 61. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you will be going over on wins being 20. I will go over as well. Alberto, give us your answer and give us the reason why. I, I choose to believe I'm going to have uh, the minors going over. I just uh, I choose to believe because Joe Golding leads the way, right? I feel good when he's uh, the leader of this Utah Miners basketball program. So I'm excited for what's to come. And, and the way they build off of what happened last year and how they got hot towards the very end, you keep a lot of your players, most of your players, that should mean good things for the minors. I'm ex- extremely excited. And I'm checking out the, the, the schedule. Now, November 25th, the minors play out in Las Vegas. I immediately went over to Expedia. If you jump out and me- don't meet me there, beat me there. Frontier tickets two and four, like there and back to Las Vegas, eighty-seven ninety-six. Ah, I love it. I love nice. it. Nice. Hey, it's birthday classic. today, everybody. I'm just saying. B- buy a little uh, Expedia gift card for a man Alberto. <laughs> I think that could work. Um, all right, I, I hear you. You're drinking a lot of the Kool Aid based off that answer. So I don't know if I've drank a ton of the Kool Aid, but I at least have a glass. I don't have a pitcher yet. I have a glass of Kool Aid, and uh, and it's sitting it's sitting nicely right now. Zay, where are you at? Well, dang. I mean, Sal says over 20 wins. Adrian says over 20 wins. Somebody's got to say under. Somebody's got to say under. Right? If I don't say under, I, it's like cursed. Right? It's the curse. It, it strikes again. I mean, I kind of have to say under, huh? But you know what? I think so. To hell with under. I'm going over. There I'm looking at this team, and I, I, I keep seeing I keep wanting to say no. Let, let me chill out. Let me chill out. But you know what? I, I, I can't hold it in anymore. Corey Camper, <laughs> Otis Frazier, David Sorrell, Kevin Kalu. I mean, this is this got to be it, right? I, it's got to be over 20 wins, and this has got to be the year that, that they, they really do make strides in the regular season. This has got to be the year that they start to play meaningful basketball in February because past two years they really haven't, let's be honest, right? That February-January stretch has been the most brutal for UTEP the past couple of years. And then, of course, last year they get hot in, they get hot in March, but – you know, you, you can't always bank on getting hot in March. You got to play relevant basketball in February. Have the dawn rocking, and I think this is as good a year to do it as any. Sal, but we have to have a scheduling yes. reminder. We need to have it right now. Uh, put it on, on your calendar on Wednesday, January first, before uh, to start the new year. Before they play La Tech in their first conference game, we just need a reminder. CUSA is a one bid league. Whatever UTEP's record is, we just need that. CUSA is a one bid league. If at that point there's something like ten and two, or you know they've won, or even if they're like six and six, forget it. It's a one bid league. Yep. Who cares? Who cares about it, non-conference? It's a one bid league in CUSA. It's it's as bad to say that even if a conference USA team is ranked, 
Let, let, let's say they have um, they have three four. Let's say they have three to four losses, right? Conference USA team is ranked. They make it to the Conference USA championship game and they lose. They're still not going to get into the tournament. No, we've seen no. that with Murray State before. We've seen it other places. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I think basketball wise, Conference USA is one of the more competitive um, non power conferences, without a doubt. So, all that to say, you have to win your your tournament to get in if you're in Conference USA. But I have an over under for for you guys. Okay, give it to all me. right, and and I'll go two stat categories, yeah. but it's on one player, and it's on none other than Kevin Kalu. Here we go. Over under four and a half points per game. Over. 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 All right. How about uh, how about you, Zay? Yeah, I'm gonna go over. I think you know. Yeah, I gotta go over. Over, Alberto. I'm saying six. You're gonna say six. Okay, and I bring this up because year one, one and a half points per game. Oh, and when no. it comes to um, oh, no. year two, three point seven. Last year, three point nine. So all that is there. However, let's flip it over on the on the other over under stat I want to get to. Over under a hundred and ninety total rebounds throughout the year. And he averaged four he's point. Gonna need, he's going to need 300 the way that this team needs okay. to rebound. So, yes, I have to go over. By necessity, over. All right. How about you guys? Either one first. Yeah. <sighs> I'm going to say over. Yeah, the miners need him. All right. Man, I'm putting the Kalu coin right here. I'm going to say over, right? It, oh. it, it, it has to be over. And, All right. You know, scarily enough, um, you know. Adrian. Hey. Is it too much to ask for? Last year, 154 total rebounds at 4.5 per game. So if he gets if he gets five and a, I don't know, maybe six or so per game, maybe so. But we'll see, man. I, I didn't answer though. I, I didn't give my answer in terms yeah. of the over under. Uh, I'm gonna go over on the points, and then as far as the the rebounds go, I'm gonna say under but like one or two okay so you just ride around that same uh average yeah uh, i think it's a it has to be a step up year for Kalu. it's uh his final year by the way so yeah let's see what happens man utep basketball tips off monday i can't wait i'm really excited for it and by the way a uh, big shout out to chris from inspo lens we were not live today on youtube we were not live today on facebook but chris from inspo lens did help us record a special sports talk minor talk mashup interview that is up right now on the inspo Lens uh, YouTube feed. It'll be up on the 600 ESPN El Paso YouTube feed this weekend. But big shout out to Chris. If you haven't checked out this conversation, it's about 40 minutes long. Uh, definitely do so before Monday. And big shout out to Inspo Lens. Hey, if you're looking for a fresh perspective on stories that inspire, check out InspoLens.com. This innovative website is dedicated to spotlighting the uplifting stories through video that don't always make the headlines. From personal triumphs to groundbreaking innovations, Inspo Lens brings you the positivity and motivation that you need. Whether you're interested in human resilience, community heroes, or simply want to start your day with something inspiring, visit InspoLens.com. Inspo Lens has it all. See the world through an inspiring eyes, positive storytelling, education, and action for good. Inspo Lens is your El Paso documentary website. New stories will be out next week. Check it out. It's the Inspo Lens YouTube channel uh that we really want to push for uh the big uh you know interview that we had over this past week so uh guys um that'll be kind of how we winded it it down here on the program and big shout out to you guys it's been a great show uh and i think what we have to do is just uh simply say hey we're gonna turn the page we're gonna look over to next week it is kennesaw state anybody want to give predictions i think utep wins uh but i've said that uh for now two weeks i thought they would beat middle tennessee i really do think they're gonna beat kennesaw state and I think especially if uh, you know Skyler Locklear is back at quarterback, I got the Miners winning this one. I think they win their second game, and these are just you know tough CUSA games that you're talking about. Uh, these other teams having to win on the road. Zay, your thoughts? Uh, UTEP, Kennesaw State next week. Turning the page. Yeah, you know I'm going to save my prediction for the Peter Polls podcast when things have you know kind of calmed down. Okay. And, you know, kind of just think I'm going to use what is what do they say? It's, it's flush Sunday, flush Monday. Scotty yes. Walton, let's call it. I'm going to have one of those for myself, so you know, no <laughs> prediction yet. All right, Alberto, where are you at? Or just give us your preview on UTEP, Kennesaw State. Where are you at right now? It's a senior day game. Uh, it's a 2 o'clock kick next Saturday. 
Well, the miners, they, they have to come out on fire, right? I think that this could be, you know, a really, it's, it could be a crucial game for the Scotty Walden uh, era or the Scotty Walden tenure. I think that if you win this game, you go out there, you handle Kennesaw State in a good way before you go out and play a, a tough Tennessee game, then you could kind of give fans something to get excited about here towards the end or maybe even something to travel out to out in Las Cruces, give yourself a better environment than the one you're going to have out in Las Cruces. So it could be important. You could really lose a lot of people because Kennesaw State is de facto the worst team in the league in Conference USA. They are by far the worst, arguably in all of FBS if uh, if it weren't for Kent State. So I think that uh, it, it's important. It's an important game. To me, it's an extremely important game due to its uh, its kind of another softball like uh, one of our callers said is and if you if you whiff on this one then uh, I don't know how you're going to regain some of those fans that are going to jump out of the boat. Sal what do you take in to go into senior week? Oh man I know there's going to be a lot of emotion and stuff but I'm going to throw all that to the side when um, they they play with a coach who's full of emotion and passion so I, I think there's no there's no turn up level when it comes to the passion when it comes to strictly football though it's it's hard for me to see UTEP beating Kennesaw State they've just looked better these last couple of weeks uh, when it comes to similar opponents do this do with this what you will. It doesn't really matter. Kennesaw lost to Western 31-14. to UTEP lost to Western. I know they scored a 17. Let's see. It was a 41 to, 44-17. to There it is. So that's one. Liberty is the other one, but we know how that one went. They actually won that game. UTEP losing that one. I do think Kennesaw State gets this one. You know, I'll go, I'll go back. And, you know, we could talk about prior opponents for Kennesaw and UTEP. It's Conference USA. It really is any given Saturday, and we've seen that before. I mean, or Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah, or Tuesday <laughs> or Wednesday. You know, we we saw Middle Tennessee get absolutely pummeled by La Tech at home, and Utah played them. You know, three point seven points, right? So it really is anything can happen. Like these predictions could be so skewed. Kennesaw State could end up winning by twenty. Utah can end up winning by twenty. Like, I guess this whole conversation just made me realize, like. It's any given Saturday with bad teams like Kennesaw State and Utah. Yeah, anything could really happen. Any given Saturday. I like the way that you put it there, Zay. Uh, guys, I think this is how we're going to wind up the show. I think we've uh, done our duty here on the program. I think that we uh, definitely have to save a little meat on the bone for Monday. I don't want to really get into specifics on players, schedules, anything until we get a chance to see UTEP Sol Ross. And for that game, what do we take away from that? Not too much, uh, but we will take a lot away from UTEP men's basketball. Oh, week from today utah valley next saturday on the road should be a great game we'll have it for you 600 espn el paso our partner station 95.5 will have the utep football game and of course like every week we will have minor talk presented by jack in the box before sal montes for the birthday boy alberto retta for zay galindo i'm adrian bradis special thanks to jack in the box to the oscar at the agency to the district pub and kitchen west to win supply el paso to new start homes and classic elegance coaches for bringing us minor talk each and every edition that'll do it for us here on the program signing off and saying so long uh thanks for everybody calling in and listening we'll be back next week on another edition of minor talk here on 600 espn el paso